Well, good evening, everyone. We welcome you to this important program led by Launch Longmont Housing. My name is Pastor Claire McNulty-Drews, and it is my honor to host here at the heart of Longmont. We are a church here that is open and inviting, and it's such a gift to have you all with us tonight. We are excited to partner with Launch in advocating for affordable housing, better public transit, and family-friendly neighborhoods. This is a vital conversation for our community, and we are thrilled to be a part of it. This evening, I'd like to share quickly just a bit about how our church became involved in affordable housing efforts particularly through the partnership with the In-Between and the Wesley Townhome Project. The initiative started as an idea, a dream, really, and today I'm proud to say it is well on its way to becoming a reality. But before I tell you more about that project, I want to lift up one particular scripture that I keep on the forefront of my daily life that comes out of my particular faith tradition. And that, that scripture is that we are our siblings keepers. It is a belief that we have a moral responsibility toward one another. We are not isolated entities, but rather members of a community and we share a collective responsibility for the well-being of others. So that's why I personally, as a, per, as a faith leader, feel so strongly about this particular conversation. So back to the project. We recognized that our north parking lot exceeded our needs. If you ever take a look at that parking lot, it's huge. And exploring how to use our resources more effectively, we saw an opportunity to make a difference in the housing crisis here in Longmont. So with unanimous support of our church leaders, we decided to donate up to an acre of land to the in-between. The goal is to develop affordable housing for families who are struggling to make ends meet. As many of you know, affordable housing is a critical issue here in Longmont. It is well documented that our city, like many others, is grappling with rising housing costs and a growing number of families experiencing homelessness. The Wesley Townhomes Project aims to address this need by providing a small community of homes. We will have 11 units where families with income below 40% of Longmont's average medium income can live. These homes will not only offer a roof over their heads, but also a place of stability and peace. The in-between will provide services to help residents build capacity and ultimately thrive in a supportive environment. The partnership continues our church's longstanding mission of serving those in our community in need, from supporting Hope's efforts to providing homes, a meals and shelter, to partnering with the, uh, the, the oldest Head Start in our community, um, our Wild Plum, for over 50 years to serve children. We have always felt called to meet the needs of the most vulnerable in our community. The Wesley Townhome Projects is an extension of that mission. It is also a testament to how churches can adapt and find new ways to serve, even in the face of challenges. Like many churches, the heart of Longmont has seen declining membership and attendance over the past several decades. While that trend is reversing, we're, we're gr grateful for that, we certainly know that we have more than we really need. And so we decided we needed to know how, figure out how to use our resources, like our land, not just for ourselves, but to benefit the wider community. In this way, what could be seen as a loss becomes a gain for families in need and affordable securing housing. As we embark on this journey, I am reminded of Isaiah 32. My people will live in peaceful dwellings, dwelling places, in secure homes, and undisturbed places of rest. This scripture speaks to the heart of what we hope to achieve with Wesley Townhomes, creating a place where families can live in peace and security 
without the constant fear of losing their homes. We know that this is a very small step in addressing a much larger problem, but it is one we are proud to take. I want to thank everyone who has partnered with us so far, our team here at Heart of Longmont, the in-between, and all of you here today. Together, we certainly can make Longmont a more affordable, inclusive, and family-friendly place to live. Before I invite Shaquille up, uh, he asked that because we are a community together tonight for a short time, if you would just stand and turn and say hello to someone near you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here. If you'll bear with me for a moment while I be a millennial. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. My name is Shaquille Dalal. I'm the president of Launch Longmont Housing. It takes a community to bring together an event like this one. There is a small but mighty army of people who have brought us here today through their sheer determination, hard work, and love for their communities. To the people who have made this evening happen, the members and supporters of Launch Longmont Housing, Prosper Longmont, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, the Longmont Museum, Strong Towns Fort Collins, Neighbors United of South Boulder, Strong Denver, the Fort Collins Chamber of Commerce, the St. Vrain Valley Habitat for Humanity, the in-between, and of course, our hearts of, the heart of Longmont, we say thank you very much. <laughs> After tonight's event, uh, please stick around in the lobby to talk to tonight's speaker and some of the amazing people and organizations working in our community to make housing more affordable and who work to make events like this happen. I'd also encourage you while you're doing that to walk up to a stranger introduce yourself, and begin the creation of another kind of community. Because while most of us don't know each other, simply by virtue of our mutual attendance tonight, I know that we have something in common. I believe that the cities of Colorado's Front Range can be great places to live, work, raise a family, and grow old. I dream of walking into a corner grocery store and seeing people of all ages and all walks of life who are my neighbors. I want to listen to the laughter of children playing in the street because their parents aren't worried about them getting hit by a car. I hope for a future where my kids not only want to stay here because it's a cool place to live, but they can afford to. I aspire to build a city, a state, and a country where every person who wants a home can find one that they can afford. And I think that you want that too. We have the power to do this. We don't need anyone to be elected president or governor. While change on the state and federal level can make this easier, it's no substitute for local action, which is where most of the choices that impact people's lives really happen. All of us who live in the cities of Colorado's Front Range can do this ourselves, one city at a time if we must. The cost of housing is a, is a choice we can choose to lower it. Chuck Marone has long been a champion of the power of small-scale action to create dramatic improvement in people's lives. Since founding Strong Towns in 2009, he has described and documented the ways that you can profoundly improve people's lives with as little as a few lines of paint. The Strong Towns ethos is focused on small-scale local action. To quote, step one, humbly observe where people around you are struggling. Step two, Identify the next smallest thing that you can do to address that struggle. Step three, do that thing. Do it right now. Step four, repeat. We are all here today because we have completed step one. The way our communities build and price housing is unsustainable, and if left unchecked, could destroy the thing that make our communities great. Step two is tonight. Step three, we do out there together. Chuck Marone. Um, thank you. That that was that was beautiful. Um, 
Thank you, everybody, for being here. It, it, it means a lot to me uh, to be invited here to your city. It means a lot to me to be invited into this space. Uh, I am very, very inspired by the work that this parish in particular is doing uh, to build housing. It is, it takes a lot to look at yourself and say, hey, uh, we, can, we can live our faith. We can uh, practice what we preach in a sense. And I'm just really, really humbled to be here. Um, I have to say, I I've been treated grandly today. Uh, this is a very nice city with very nice people. Uh, I had uh, my glasses broke on the way here. I've got this brand new set of glasses, and for some reason they just fell apart. Um, and if you're someone, if I take them off, I can see that you're all there, but uh, you have no expressions, and now I can see you. Um, I went to Pearl Vision over by, if I were to describe this for people here, what would I say? Is the only Pearl Vision in town, I'm guessing? Maybe? Someone, oh, edge of town? I went to Pearl Vision, all right? Um, I walked in, and the manager came up to me and said, can I help you? And I just gave him my glasses. I said, I'm from out of town. I have this emergency. And he said, just sit down. I'll be right back. And he went in the back room. He fixed my glasses. He came back. They were better than when I had them originally. He tightened them all up and made it work perfect. He gave them to me, and he said, no, no charge for this. This is, this is something that we do here. Um, it is those kind of little things that, that mean so much. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's, it's very, I'm a Catholic. Catholics aren't allowed to stand up here like this. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've been invited to speak in enough churches, but it takes me a while to get used to this. Um, you all are looking at me, but I'm looking at love, uh, faith, and hope, uh, which is written on the back, which is a, a kind of a beautiful way, I think, to think about uh, what we are called to do and what we're, what we're doing here tonight. So let's, let's get started. Um, in our country, uh, we're having a really fascinating, <laughs> would be maybe a generous way to say it, we're having a, a conversation about housing. And when we ask people, kind of, I do, a, I, I do a ton of travel, big cities, small towns, everything in between. When we ask people, is there a housing crisis, what we get is yes. There's a housing crisis. Yes, it's kind of universally agreed. There's something broken. There's something wrong with housing in this country. But when we ask people, all right, uh, to solve this problem, what direction do housing prices need to go? And the answer is pretty split. There's part of our society that says housing prices, to fix this problem, housing prices need to go up. That would solve our problem. We need, we need housing prices to go up. There's another part of our conversation that says, uh, to fix this, we need housing prices to go down. My, my, my guess, my surmising, just by the crowd here tonight, is that we probably have a predominance of people who are in the second category. But I, I put this stat up because I want you to recognize that there are a lot of people in the first category, and they're in first categories for very rational reasons. We have two housing conversations going on in this country right now, um, two separate conversations. One is about housing as shelter. That is the group that says housing prices need to go down. We have people who are uh, not able to afford housing. If they are able to get in housing, it is higher than what they can afford. We have people who are going without housing. Uh, we need prices to come down so more people can get housing. There is another conversation around housing that has to do with housing as a financial product. Housing as uh, part of an overall financial system. Housing that sits in its many derivative forms mortgage-backed securities, uh, derivatives on those securities, hypothecations, bets on those things uh, that sit at the heart of every bank, every local bank, every regional bank, every national bank in the country. And for people in that conversation, the idea of housing prices going anywhere but up is very, very scary. In one conversation, housing prices, ooh, that was very weird. Um, for some reason, my animations are not working, which is a problem. Uh, no. OK. We'll do, this, we'll do this the hard way. It's all right. If you can fix that, you can change it on the fly. And I'll keep going. If you can't fix it, I'll make it work because I'm a professional, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
in one of our conversations, housing prices uh, must come down. In another one of our conversations, housing prices cannot be allowed to go down. Um, this is the essence of the housing trap. This is the place that we are in. We can't go left, we can't go right, we can't go up, we can't go down. Every direction has serious, serious consequences. And the feeling that is expressed to me most often about housing in this country, particularly as we talk to local leaders, people who care deeply about this, uh, people who want to uh, see things change, um, there is a feeling of abject helplessness that is communicated to me quite often. This problem seems huge. It seems beyond us. Even when we look at our own like regional housing studies, they'll say things like, well, you're building 5,000 units a year and you need to have 50,000 more uh, built to meet affordability you know, ratios. It, it just seems like an insurmountable problem. If I do my job here tonight, um, you will leave without a feeling of, of hopelessness. You'll leave with a feeling of there are things we can do uh, to make this better. I want to get a little bit, um, let's say, geeky with you about uh, the way we finance housing because a, a huge part of this story and a huge part of the story that uh, we don't really talk about that often is the impact of how we have changed uh, the way we finance homes. If we went back 100 years ago, uh, many of us don't realize that a mortgage at that time was very, very different than a mortgage today. In fact, a mortgage today would be unrecognizable to anyone 100 years ago or anywhere in all of human history prior to that period of time. If you were going to get a mortgage in the 1920s, you had to have a 50% down payment. Uh, you had to come with cash for 50%. The bank would lend you up to half of what your house was worth. They would then lend to you not in a 30-year mortgage, they would lend to you in a short-term product, something that would be like a three-year or five-year with a balloon payment on the end. You weren't gonna pay principal and interest, you were gonna pay interest only. And so at the end of five years, the idea was you would either have saved up some money, you could pay it down, borrow less next time over, or you would pay it off, like you've been able to you know, buy out your mortgage, or most likely, you would roll it over into another interest-only loan. The reason that we did it this way, or the reason that banks did it this way, is because it is really, really risky to lend over a long period of time. Banks, especially local banks, small local banks at that time, and remember, a, a local bank you know, in a city would have been like, I'm taking your money and I'm lending it to you, right? I'm taking your money and I'm, I'm lending it to you, right? It's, it, it, is, it is a transaction that is hyper-local. And if I'm going to do that, I'm going to require the pe person that I'm lending to to have a lot of skin in the game because if they don't follow through, if they don't make their payments, if they default in some way, I got to go back to the, 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 the lender that is their neighbor and say, hey, you, I don't have your money. This made local banking like hyper conservative. And so short term loans uh, financed with interest only. This is the way housing has been done for as long as I've been looking back at it, right? For as long as I've seen back in the history books, because housing was a local product financed uh, locally. This changed during the Great Depression, and it changed for some very uh, simple, some very logical, and I'm going to even suggest some very moral reasons. Uh, I want you to, and I don't have the animation here, so this is, let's see if it does. Nope. Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. I think I did this one with different slides, so this one is like foolproof. You've got a really great, uh, what do you call your job? Tech support? Tech person? I don't even know, like, you got AV tech. You've got a really cool AV person at this church. So, uh, yes, very cool. Yeah, I, I do this stuff a lot. And so being able to walk into a place and have someone who not only knows what they're doing, but is like there ready to help, like get it all set up, it is really cool. Um, so let's say that uh, you had a house, you had a mortgage, you've got a five-year uh, mortgage with a balloon payment on the end. 
And now we go into the Great Depression, and what happens to housing prices? Housing prices go down. At the beginning, there is an animation here that's missing, but it's okay, I'll walk you through it. Uh, at the beginning, you have a home value, and half the value is the amount that they would lend to you. After your home drops in value, the bank is only going to lend to you half of that new value. This is what you owe. This is what the bank will lend you. Your house is worth less. They're going to lend you less. And so this is what they require from you in cash to refinance your loan in the middle of the Great Depression when unemployment is over 25% and people are struggling to get by. What happens if you can't come up with that cash? Yeah, you lose your house, right? You get foreclosed on. And what, what, what does the bank do with your house when they foreclose on your house? Do they keep it and like throw block parties and stuff? No, they have to make their money back. And so what they do is they put the house up for sale. What happens when you put a house up for sale in a declining market? Housing prices go down even further. And then what happens to the next person who comes in to refinance? They need to have even more cash. Their house gets repossessed. It is what economists call a deflationary spiral. As prices drop, more and more people, people who could afford to make the payments, people who could afford uh, to you know, continue to stay in the house, people who had equity and were dedicated to staying there, were for no fault of their own getting kicked out of their homes and losing their wealth, losing their, their abode. At the beginning of the New Deal, one of the things that FDR's administration did in the first 100 days is say, we have to stop this deflationary spiral. The first thing they did, they went to local banks and they said, look, um, if you have someone in foreclosure, don't foreclose on them, don't kick them out. We will buy that loan from you. So we'll take that loan over, the federal government will. This is unprecedented, this has never been done, right? We'll, we'll take this loan over from you. And then they turned around to the homeowners and they said, all right, we realize we got a little bit of a pickle here. How about we refinance that for you over 12 years? So we'll make the payments lower. We'll make it easier for you to stay there. We'll refinance it over 12 years. Don't worry. Let's make all this stable so we stop prices from going down. They then went to homeowners and they said, all right, um, we will refinance it over 12 years. Let's extend that to 15 years. Let's make it 20 years. And when we make it 20 years, instead of making it an interest-only loan, uh, let's make it a principal and interest loan. So at the end of that 20-year period, you actually own the house outright. No more rolling over the loans and all that kind of volatility. Let's do it that way. They also said, all right, uh, local banks, you want 50% down. Uh, how about we do 40% down or 30% or down? And I know that creates extra risk for you. So what we're going to do is the federal government is going to provide mortgage insurance to make sure that you can make that loan with some degree of confidence. Uh, we want to make sure that you can uh, make that loan. And if something goes bad, the federal government will, in a sense, come in and make, make you whole. We also established an organization called Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae was designed uh, to help local banks write long-term loans. And by long-term loans, I'm going to say, from a local bank's perspective, risky loans. Uh, I'll explain why the risk is there in a second. But the idea was, we want you, local bank, to do something that you don't want to do. You are willing to write short-term loans. We want you to write long-term loans. And if you follow the requirements that we're setting up, if you have a certain amount down, if you can uh, credit that these people are um, you know, worthy borrowers. If you can, and I'm going to have a side note here, this is where redlining comes in. If they are in you know, good neighborhoods, uh, if you meet all these requirements and check off the boxes, uh, we, the federal government, will buy that loan from you whenever you want to sell it. Fannie Mae will do that. So if you get three years or four years down the road and you need some liquidity because something else has gone wrong in your portfolio, there's a market for that loan. Don't worry, you can always unload it as long as it meets these requirements. What this did is it stopped the downward spiral of home prices. It allowed people to stay in their homes. It stabilized the market 
in the Great Depression in one of the most tumultuous times in our economic history. And I'm going to say this, and I, I don't generally speak in these words, but I, I think it is an important thing to say in light of what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, I think, personally, that this was a moral thing to do. It's hard to, for me to go back and look at this situation and identify something in 1932 to 38 that we could have done dramatically different to solve this problem. Now, local banks hate this. They do not like borrowing short and lending long. It is incredibly risky. Um, this slide generally does not have all the stuff in the background. It just says, borrowing short and lending long is risky, and then I unveil the federal government steps in to make that less risky for banks. But let's deal with the first part first. Why do local banks not like to do this? When I say borrowing short and lending long, that is kind of an inside finance lingo kind of way. Let me walk you through what that means. When banks borrow short, what are they doing? They are collecting deposits from you. And what can you do as a depositor in a checking account or a basic savings account? You can, at any time, call your loan. You have lent the bank this money. You can go in an hour later and say, I want my money back out. That is the shortest of short loans. What does it mean, then, to lend long? It means to take that short-term money and lend it out over a longer period of time. The longer the period of time, the more risky it is, because the more chance that something will go wrong. If a bank is paying, let's say, 5% interest rates, which I know sounds insane today, but let, just roll with me for a minute. This used to be normal for, for you millennials, for you younger people. Banks used to do pay this thing called interest. It was really wild. <laughs> um, Let's say the bank will pay you 5% interest to put your money on deposit there. They would then go out and lend it to someone at, let's say, 7%. That 2% difference is the way the bank makes their money, right? And if it's a good loan and they pay it off, the bank does really well, right? That's how the banks make their money. What happens if we have a bout of inflation and inflation climbs? What do people demand when inflation is high? They demand higher rates of interest. I'm losing money every month due to inflation. If I'm going to lend you money, I, I, I want a higher rate of return to make up for that loss. And so now interest rates go from 5% to, let's say, 8%. OK, I'm the bank. I have to pay everybody 8% to deposit money in my bank. But I've got this loan sitting on my books that I'm only getting 7% from. So I am losing money every month. I have one of two options. I either don't pay 8% interest, and then all my depositors leave, because they'll go to the bank that will, and my bank collapses, or I slowly bleed to death every month losing a little bit of money. This is why banks write short-term loans. Local banks do not like to do long-term loans. Because if you do short-term loans, the bleeding ends at some point. You can roll your portfolio over and fix it, make it right. If you have a bunch of 20-year and 30-year loans on your books, you can never fix that problem. That problem is going to go your entire career. You're going to lose money if interest rates go the wrong way for you. And so banks do not like to do this kind of loan. The way we got banks to do this kind of loan and keep people in their homes was the federal government stepped in and said, we will bear that risk for you. When this goes bad, which it will at some point go bad, we will be there to pick up the pieces. We will be there to help you out. That is the trade-off that we made in the 1930s. At the end of World War II, if, if, we, if we look at, let me ask this. I don't want to do too many diversions here tonight, um, but you all are smiling and nodding. So that encourages me to do diversions. If you want this to be done quick, just frown and be angry looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the, let me ask this question. What is the thing that got us out of the Great Depression? Yeah, 
we're, we're taught in like junior high that it's World War II, right? Which is an insane notion. You, you, if you just have that like insight, you recognize how much of our cultural vocabulary is defined by economists and economic thinking. Hey, we're out of the depression now. Yay, happy times are here again. Million, tens of millions of people dead, uh, rationing of you know, daily needs. We're going to take millions of people and traumatize them by shipping them over to take part in this war. We're going to draft all these other people to build things that are not useful just for blowing up. This, this is not like good times. But if you're an economist, World War II was awesome because it solved the Great Depression, right? Okay. I hope you recognize that like, a twisted way of thinking, right? It's a very warped way of thinking. Um, yet, as the war was coming to an end, the economists around FDR started to freak out. Um, you have Paul Samuelson, who was the chief economic advisor to the president, say this in a memo, like, if this war ends today, we're screwed. Like, we're going to have the greatest period of economic dislocation the world has ever seen. If we demobilize and bring these millions of troops home and we shut down all these industries of war and send everybody back home, we are just going to go right back into the middle of the Great Depression. There is nothing different about our economy today than there was 10 years ago. Is that what happened? Of course that's not what happened, right? We, we all know what happened, right? We've all, we, 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 we have the gift of hindsight. What happened is we took all of this uh, industrial capacity we had as the only major power not decimated by war. We took, uh, you know, the world's gold. Uh, we had the world's reserve currency. We took all of that might. We were pulling more oil out of the ground than Saudi Arabia. We, we literally were the richest country by leagues in the world. And we took all of this capacity, including, by the way, having a culture that had been united in a common struggle, I think that's important to not overlook the cultural aspect of this. We took all of that capacity and we redirected it into building a new version of America, a version of America that would give us grow, grow, grow economic growth. And from a housing standpoint, what we recognized was that all of the tools that kept housing prices from plunging would work really well if we just had them flipped around the other way, we can make housing prices go up, up, up with these same exact tools. And so this is what we did. Um, we experienced, at the end of World War II, uh, this kind of miracle couple of decades of growth. Um, the, uh, the, the yellow line there is GDP. Uh, our in the two decades after World War II, we had the most uh, aggressive period of growth that our economy has ever experienced. Uh, our federal debt went up slightly from historically high levels at the end of World War II. Uh, at the end of World War II, we had more debt than we had ever had as a country, uh, debt per, per capita, debt per GDP, at whatever ratio you want. Um, but because our growth was so aggressive, that debt to GDP ratio went down, 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 down. Um, this is where the adage, grow your way out of debt, comes from, because we did it in the two decades after World War II. Um, I'm going to, another diversion, because you're all still smiling. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we are in an election year. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to say something. And I, I want you to, if you know you are a very partisan person, I want you to uh, try to dial down, like resist the temptation to have a knee-jerk partisan reaction to what I'm going to say next, because I certainly do not mean it in a partisan way. Um, I remember back in 2016, uh, which was another presidential election year, um, when we had two candidates running for president who were of similar age. And I remember listening to both of these candidates, and they both were sharing to us a vision of what they saw the potential of America being. Um, one of those visions was centered around um, Ozzy and Harriet-style families and, and blue-collar jobs. Uh, another one of those visions was centered around uh, a federal government that 
could, could do expansive things, right? Uh, could uh, expand Social Security, could expand Medicare, could be kind of a, a helpful assistant in growing an American dream. And I realized as I listened to these two candidates that what I was hearing was them suggesting to us that they wanted to recreate the two greatest decades of their life, which was the two decades immediately after World War II. We nostalgize this period of time today because it was such an astounding success coming after really 15 years of deep, deep, deep hardship. Um, here's the thing that is part of this story that is rarely told. The idea here is that we grew our way out of debt. And again, if you are an economist, particularly economists worried about government policy at the federal level, we grew our way out of debt. If you are an economist or a human being who looks at things from a broader perspective, you realize that we didn't grow our way out of debt. We simply shifted our debt from the public balance sheet to the private balance sheet. We fueled this couple decades of growth by having the private sector take on astounding levels of debt. Mortgage debt grew by over 1,000% in these two decades. Um, as we built homes, as we created that, that, that version of the American dream that we still talk about. This is less cool without the animation, because I do these one at a time. But let me do it in macro and in, in total. Because really, what the story of post-war, and this is... Uh, a, a, an index called the Case-Shiller Index. It is a tracking of home prices over time. Um, what you see in this index is that we had a very successful couple decades after World War II as we went and tried this new experiment, this new way of building a, a, a America, a new version of American life and living. You saw that it was very easy for us to see substantial gains. If you go out and uh, buy a home, you are, in a sense, financing all of the people who uh, laid out that subdivision, put in the road, put in the sewer and water, built the house, designed that, did all that. When someone comes and buys that home from you 20 years later, um, what they are buying is a liability. Now I have to fix the roof. Now I've got to fix the siding. Now I've got to fix the sidewalks. Oh, now the city has to pay to maintain the road. The city has to pay through my taxes to fix this pipe. The city has to pay this. It is a great financial boom in the first generation. In the second generation, the costs start to weigh. And this was the first book at Strong Towns that we put together was all about the imbalance of those costs, how as we grow as cities, we get all this cash and all this benefit, but we take on this future liability. And the future liability is so much greater than the money we bring in. As we go on, what we see over and over and over again is this kind of dance between housing as a shelter and housing as a financial product. With housing as a financial product growing and growing and growing with every iteration. The first iteration here, I call it the first inflationary bubble, is a period of time where uh, the economy started to sputter. Um, this was really at the end of that first initial blast of suburban-style development. The, housing, the, the, the liabilities started to come due, and the, the economy started to sputter. We lowered interest rates. We reduced down payment requirements. We extended loans from 20 years to 30 years. Uh, we made the payments go over a longer period of time. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff to, in a sense, juice the housing market and get housing going again as a way to experience the, a repeat of the 20 years we just experienced. If we can get housing going, and we can get building, and we can get doing stuff, we can create jobs and growth and economic development, and everything would be great. We had a second bubble. We ultimately got into a period where uh, fraud became kind of a mechanism for us to, in a sense, juice the economy in the short term. Uh, we ultimately ended up in the early 2000s uh, with what has been kind of commonly agreed to as the subprime bubble. Uh, this period of time where um, I use the term fraud for the SNL bubble. Um, in the SNL bubble, there were actually people who went to prison. <laughs> uh, <laughs> again, millennial, <laughs> so quaint. <laughs> people go to prison for fraud. <laughs> 
It's so 1980s, right? Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, there was plenty of finger pointing of fraud, but not a lot of, uh, not a lot of, not any um, convictions for fraud in the subprime bubble. Um, I think what is interesting to note about um, this are really two things. The first one is not evident in the, in the Case-Shiller Index, but it underlies it. And that is this. Every single one of these iterations involved us having a national panic and conversation over housing. We were writing reports in the 1970s about how there weren't enough homes, home prices were too expensive, people were being left behind. The same things we're writing today, our think tanks were writing back then, right? And every time we responded to them by making it easier for people to borrow more money. We have 30% down payment requirement. Ooh, now it's 20% down payment. Now it's 10% down payment. Now it, it is a 5% down payment. How about 2%? How about no down payment? How about you actually borrow more than what your house is worth? We've gone on that journey together, right? Um, we've also done the lowering of interest rates. Every time uh, you know, there's a, any kind of economic upset, we lower interest rates. We make it easier for people to, again, pay more for a house. If you can afford this much money, uh, monthly payment, and interest rates are low, uh, you can buy this much house. If interest rates are high, you can buy this much house. Your payment is the same. And so when we lower payments, what we do is we make it easier for people at this much to pay more for a house. We make housing prices go up. Um, we have been dedicated in each of these iterations to juicing the housing market. And we, we couch this, right? We say we're making housing more affordable, uh, we're making it uh, more accessible, we're having an ownership society. Um, Democratic administrations have ways of talking about this, Republican administrations have ways of talking about this. Um, but the, the commonality of them is that they are all coming up with ways to allow people to leverage more debt in order to pay more for housing. The other part of this that you do see in the Case-Shiller Index is the result of that, right? Each of these iterations is greater than the next, in a sense. I know we're in a state where you experience snow, so I can describe this, this experience we have in Minnesota, and you will understand. When you're driving on a snowy road and you lose your, your way a little bit, um, you are trained to not overcorrect, right? Because if you overcorrect, what happens? You skid the other way, and then you skid the other way, and pretty soon your car is just spinning around. In an economic sense, we see that happening. The correction, the overcorrection, the overcorrection, the overcorrection. After 2008, it felt like maybe things would change, right? We had been through um, what was a near-death experience for our economy. Um, again, millennials, uh, I love picking on you. Um, <laughs> There is this, uh, I read this saying once, um, if, you, if you are not frustrated with the generation ahead of you and bewildered by the generation behind you, uh, you're not really living, right? Um, <laughs> as an Xer, no one cares about us, but I, I you know, have this innate frustration with boomers and this innate bewilderment with millennials. Um, I love you, though, I really do. Um, one of the things that uh, came out of that uh, 2008 crisis um, was the idea that we uh, experienced this near-death condition, and so we had to make some deep, deep fundamental changes. And by near-death condition, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to help the people who remember this to recall, uh, we were told, as Americans, that if we did not give our seven largest banks a trillion dollars within 24 hours, by next Wednesday, there would be no food on the shelves. There would be no money in the ATMs. Our society would crumble. If you look at the scenarios that are possible in our system, that is not one that I ever thought was possible, right? Like, that, that does not seem like an outcome that was possible, yet we were presented with this, if we don't do this now, this is what happens. That's what I mean by near-death experience. Like that, that is the equivalent of a human having a heart attack and then saying, all right, you need to change your diet and exercise approach, right? Um, here's what we did instead. Um, this is a, a chart of, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we, <laughs> right? Like past the red meat and, uh, and the remote control. Um, this is a, a graph from the Fed of housing starts. And I think we can all understand uh, and, and maybe even uh, empathize or graphs the reason why housing starts collapsed after 2008. Um, there's been a lot of interesting things written recently about housing supply. Um, but sitting on the ground in 2008, 2009, particularly in states like California and Florida um, and Texas, uh, there was an absolute glut of homes. Uh, there were way, way, way too many houses. Um, maybe not in every market, but what we did see in every market was a dramatic decrease in prices. And, and, and when there is a decrease in prices, uh, that dramatic banks uh, stop lending. And so you saw a dramatic decrease in the number of houses being built. That, that's what I've highlighted on this chart. Housing starts dropped to their lowest levels ever. They've been climbing up since then, uh, but they were very, very low. What also happened in 2008? Um, my millennial boss graduated from college, right? 2007 or eight? Yeah. Um, he, he was smart enough to get an architecture degree and then uh, go entering the workforce at the lowest point of architectural demand <laughs> in post-war era. It was great timing. That's how I got into tech. It is. Um, this is uh, Andrew Burleson. He is our board chair. He's been our board chair for a decade. He helped start strong towns and make all of this possible. And he lives among you in Denver now um, and uh, graciously came up tonight to be part of this. So thank you, Andrew. And the whole crew from uh, Strong Denver is amazing. Uh, we stopped building houses. At the same time, and again, uh, highlighting, uh, the millennial generation reached the age where they would start buying homes. Here's the fascinating thing about millennials. Um, Baby boomers, we all recognize as a huge generation, right? Um, my generation, the Xers, much, much smaller. That's why you guys don't think of us very much. Um, millennials is the echo of the boomers. Again, really, really huge. And so all of a sudden, at a time when this huge generation was kind of emerging into adulthood, where you would normally rent a house, buy a house, start, you know, propagating, uh, all that fun stuff, um, there were no houses. There were no houses being built. There were no houses being on construction. Uh, there was no way to get a loan. This was like a really, really difficult time. Um, simultaneous with that, we had this financial problem. And let me explain the financial problem because I've, I've kind of glossed over it, but I, I want to get to like the heart of things. Um, in the 1970s, uh, as we were... Uh, kind of undergoing uh, one of these cycles. Uh, we created uh, Freddie Mac, which is a, in a sense, competitor to Fannie Mae. They would buy loans from local banks, allow local banks to make these long-term loans, take them off their books. Um, we also created an entity called Ginny, uh, Ginny Mae. Uh, this was uh, a kind of a specialty thing to do something very, very similar uh, for con j just for qualifying loans. Ultimately, we allowed Fannie and Freddie to buy non-qualified loans, to buy like weird financial instruments. It became very weird after a while. Um, but they became more and more kind of a private entity with government support and backing. Um, in the 1970s, they began uh, this process of doing uh, mortgage-backed securities. A mortgage-backed security is impossible to understand and very simple to understand. So I'm going to give you the simple version, recognizing that like, in a true financial sense, these are really, really complex things. But in a big picture sense, what you are doing with a mortgage-backed security is you are buying a bunch of mortgages, bundling them together, and then cutting it up like a, a stock and selling a share of that to different people. If you buy one, you will be getting the pledged uh, payments of many, many different borrowers, but a small part of it, right? So I'll have a small part of your mortgage payment, a small part of your mortgage payment, a small part of your mortgage payment, a small part of your mortgage payment will come to me. That's what a mortgage-backed security is. By the time we get to the subprime crisis, um, two like big things had happened. The first one is that during one of these kind of bubbles, uh, periods of time, one of the ways we juiced the housing market is that Congress passed a law saying, 
If you buy a mortgage-backed security that is rated double A or higher as a bank, you can use that as your reserve as if it were a treasury note. Banks are required to hold stable reserves. And so we said, uh, if you buy a, a chunk of the American dream, part of the housing market, this bundle of mortgage-backed securities, um, you can use that for your reserve instead of a treasury note, which is supposed to be like the, the gold standard, quote unquote, the gold standard, right? What this did is it created an insatiable demand for mortgage-backed securities. Because if you're a bank and you have to hold reserves, it's basically like dead money. You got to just keep there, like hold it, right? But if you can do some of that as a mortgage-backed security, well, you can get a return on that now. And it's going to be higher than what you would get if you bought treasury notes. The other thing that we did is we started to change the nature of what mortgage-backed securities were. The very first ones were bundles of the most conservative loans that you can imagine. So take, you know, they didn't have credit scores back then. Uh, that was an innovation that came about in the 1990s. Um, they didn't have credit scores, so you actually had people sitting down and uh, working out with people who wanted to buy homes uh, to qualify them. You would have mortgages that were qualified mortgages um, with good ratings, good payment history, all that, that were bundled together and sold off. By the time you get to the subprime crisis, you have not only mortgages that have very, very high-risk borrowers kind of hidden within them, and there's a, I mean, we could do two hours on how that came about, um, but you have uh, hypothecations, like de derivatives of these things. Uh, mortgages became such a crucial part of our underlying banking system um, that we couldn't create enough of them. In other words, there weren't enough people to take out loans that we could turn into mortgage-backed securities. And so what we started to do is make these things called synthetic mortgages. You have a mortgage, and we would just say, here's a copy of your mortgage, and then let's place bets and stuff on that. This is stuff beyond my capacity to fully understand. I think it's beyond almost everybody's capacity to fully understand. Um, this is kind of the wildest gambling. So you have this thing that is the stability, the, the foundation of our banking system that has now turned into kind of the most wild west of financial products. Ben Bernanke in 2012, looking at kind of the aftermath of this crisis and seeing we can't do this mortgage thing because we can't get people to buy homes. Um, prices have to go up. If prices stay down, this is like undermining the whole system. What do we do? And the quote came from a speech that he gave uh, as Fed chair, where he said, you know, with home prices falling and rents rising, it would make sense in some markets to turn some of the foreclosed homes into rental properties. There's a big debate today, 2024, over the influence, what is the influence level of investors versus non-investors. This is something that is like deeply contested by economists. It's also deeply contested by housing advocates for a whole variety of reasons. We are in a sense in the fog of war uh, in terms of housing prices. Like after the next crash, there will be an accounting of everything that went wrong. It's unclear. But what is clear is that in the years immediately after this speech, there was tons of money pumped into banks that were then pumped into hedge funds that then went out and bought lots and lots of homes. This was something that was not possible even in the 1990s. Uh, it was impossible for a hedge fund in Connecticut to run 1,000 rental properties all over the country. You, you kind of had to be local to do that because you had to go check on things and da 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 da. But with the advent of computers and databases and, and, and all uh, you know, the iPad, you can send someone out to take some notes, uh, being able to do that in a systematic way became very, very easy. As easy as credit scores made uh, making loans, right? Here's where we're at today then. Oh, I, I do get to do the thing. So we have a couple inflation bubbles. We have an SNL bubble. We have a subprime bubble. And let me be clear. Uh, there's really is no, I, I'm, I'm going to say this in an absolute, and I shouldn't say it in absolute. 
I have not run into an economist who is not willing to call 2000 to 2008 a bubble. We colloquially, you know, as, 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 as just normal people, we think of it as a bubble. If you listen to financial news, they talk about it as a bubble. We look at it in retrospect as a bubble. We use this term bubble. Um, here's where we're at. Oh, that was horrible. My slide didn't work. It's okay. I will describe what happened. <laughs> um, subprime went down a little bit, not even to the SNL bubble line. It went down a little bit, and then went up. And you can see where it says housing, R-E. That word is recovery. That's where we're at today, way up in the upper right, housing recovery, way higher. You might ask the obvious question, how do you recover to a bubble? I think, like, you know, again, if the world wasn't run by economists, if our vocabulary and our common way of speaking wasn't so dominated by economic talk, we would be questioning that. We wouldn't call it a recovery because it's actually insane to say that was a bubble and now we're higher and this is a recovery. Recovery to what? Like that doesn't make sense. Um, yet this is where we find ourselves today. So here's the question I want you to struggle with. For a long, long time, we've had this belief among us that when someone bought a house, that someone was the customer and the house was the product. I think if we go back to the Great Depression, if we go back to the first kind of generation of suburban expansion, um, what we see is that that was largely the case. But today, we've reached this point where it's no longer what is the product, it's really more who is the product. The product here is not you buying a house. It's someone buying your mortgage. When you buy a house, what you do that is invaluable to the economy is you create a piece of paper, a mortgage, that can be sold off, bundled, securitized, hypothecated, bet against in many, many, many different ways, and in a sense, fuel what we look at today as growth in the economy. When we recognize this, we have to recognize a, a, a related fact. Making it easier for more people to borrow more money, to pay more for housing, is not the answer to our housing crisis. It's actually the problem that we're trying to escape from. When you listen to, and, and I'm going to say this, and then this will sound partisan, and I, I really, really, really do not mean it this way, because I used to talk about this before my uh, governor was the vice presidential candidate. Um, but I'm from Minnesota, so I'm talking a little bit in-house, out of house. I don't mean this as a reflection on my governor personally. This is a broad policy that we see in many, many states. But my governor earlier this year, to address the housing crisis in our state, um, said, we are going to give uh, first-time homebuyer assistance up to, I think, $40,000 to help people buy a house. Now, I'm going to say, I get where that comes from. L let's, let's, let's give as much, um, I was looking up there for the word grace. Um, I have two daughters. One, the youngest one is Stella Faith. Um, because faith is a, a, beautiful, uh, a beautiful state to be in. The other one is Chloe Grace, um, because grace is a gift. Let, let's have grace towards the intentions of my governor. Not look at this as a political decision, but look at this as an empathetic human response to what is a real crisis. Giving people $40,000 to help them buy a house is going to allow them to do what? pay $40,000 more than they otherwise would be able to. And I get that that may help that family. Like, I get that. I understand that. And that is an urgent need. Like, I'm not trying to diminish that. But that is going to hurt every other family that is having difficulty getting into a house. That actually does not solve the problem. This, since 
the 1970s, the late 1960s, early 1970s, and really since the Great Depression, is how we have tried to solve our housing problems. We have run out of being able to use this successfully to do that. And let me give you one other thing before we go on. Um, two weeks ago, there was an article that came out uh, written by a high-profile economist who made the case that what we need right now, and this was a person who has worked in housing advocacy for a long time. Uh, I am not questioning that they care deeply about people who are struggling because that, the work that this man has done has been all in that field. How do we build affordable housing? How do we get people into houses? Compassionate person. His central argument was that it is now time for us to roll out at scale the 40-year mortgage. 40-year mortgages would allow people to spread that payment out over a longer period of time, allowing them to afford today's higher housing prices. The way I would say that is making someone a debt slave for 10 years longer, forcing them to pay practically interest only for the first decade of their mortgage, would allow them to pay more for a house than they otherwise would. I think we need to be done with that type of thinking. So here's the challenge that I have for us. We talk a lot about affordable housing and the need to make affordable housing. And we see cities out there doing projects to build affordable housing. Um, I, I feel uh, inspired by this congregation going out and building units here and trying to get people into affordable housing. But let's step back and recognize, I'm gonna say this in a way, and I mean this, again, with a lot of generosity. Part of what we talk about at Strong Towns is doing what you can. I'm, I'm inspired by this church, this congregation, doing what they can. But let's acknowledge, from a big picture standpoint, that 12 units is spit in a bucket of what is needed. If we all do what we can, yes, we can, we can help move this. But the idea that we can continue to build affordable housing and have that somehow solve the problem is, again, one of these things that is a fallacy. We can look at the numbers and see the problem is too great. So are we trying to make affordable housing? Are we trying to build affordable housing units? Or are we trying to make housing affordable? Is our goal to actually go out and build housing that would be quote unquote affordable within this marketplace where all housing prices otherwise are climbing to unaffordable levels? Or is our job here to make housing affordable? I think we have to have a serious conversation about how we get out of this housing trap, how we get out of this spiral and start making housing affordable. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to talk about how to do that with the remaining time we have. Um, to, to make this switch, I want you to look at these and recognize that these today, today, in 2024, these are financial products. Secondarily, they serve as shelter, but primarily they are financial products. The single family home is a fantastic financial product. You can create a mortgage on it. That mortgage can be standardized with other single family homes in different geographies around the country. If I say I own a single family home that's four bedroom, three bath, da, this size lot, da, da da da, that can be standardized with other houses across the country. It can be sold off, bundled, securitized, go through that whole process. This is a fantastic financial product. There's a massive amount of market for this product. On the right, you see a, a typical five over one. I was shown lots and lots of these today, or derivations of this product. Uh, this is, again, a great financial product. You can build these for high end, you can build these for cheaper prices, you can uh, accessorize them with all kinds of different things. They compare well to each other, so you can say, we've got one of these in Longmont, we've got one of these in Brainerd, Minnesota, and you can like, take those as a standard package, put them together, again, sell them off onto a secondary market, bundle them together, and, and sell them off to people as securities. These are great, great, great financial products. There's tons of liquidity for these projects, for these products. 
If we look at a chart, a bell curve of uh, liquidity, of where there's capital in our system, there is lots and lots of money out there to build these financial products. If you are a single family home builder and you are out there building single family homes, you can't build them fast enough. They are throwing money at you. Uh, you can go out and build, 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 and there's tons of money being put into that. If you are building five over ones, if you are one of those companies doing that, if you are building these apartment buildings, again, you can do them over and over and over in every market. I spent last week on the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation in northern North Dakota. 144 square miles, 5,000 people. It was, it, was, it was tragic and beautiful at the same time. Um, when I was there, we went and visited a newer housing development that had four of these buildings, the, the big apartment buildings. This is not a place, 144 square miles. Like, get your mind wrapped around that. This is huge. 5,000 people, 6,000 people. They do not need five over ones. Why was it there in the middle of an Indian reservation in northern North Dakota? It was there for one reason, because it's a great financial product. And there is a cash flow that can be tapped into by building it there. It's not that that was the housing that they needed. I mean, my gosh, they needed way other things. It's not the housing that would best suit them. This was built like four miles out of town in the middle of nowhere, isolated from everything. It was built because there's a cash flow associated with it. It is a good financial product. Uh, on the far right side here, I've just displayed what I consider like a wealthy person's home, right? Let's be very clear. Wealthy people have no problem financing their housing. Bill Gates does not have a problem financing his house. A, a person with, you know, 1% uh, of the value of Bill Gates has no problem financing their house, right? We don't worry about that in the spectrum. The end of the spectrum where there are no financial products and therefore no products being built in the market is on the far low end of the spectrum. That is where there's massive demand, but in the market for housing that we have constructed, there is nobody filling that demand. What we need to do is we need to fill that demand and fill it aggressively. Let me give you kind of a sense of what that market looks like. For really forever, up until modern times, up until really, uh, you know, the, the, the post-war era, it was very, very common for people to rent out bedrooms in their homes. In fact, if, if you look at like, you know, older cities, you would have a hotel that would be really, really nice you might have a saloon that was less so, but most people visiting a town would like stay in someone's bedroom somewhere. It was very common for people to put out a little sign and say, you know, uh, bed and breakfast, stop in. Uh, you can, you know, for a nickel or a dime, you can sleep in the bed upstairs and we'll give you some food when you leave in the morning. That was like really, really common. And I wrote in the Escaping the Housing Trap, if we went back 100 years, housing was abundant, it was cheap, and it was really low quality. Today, when we look across the landscape, we can recognize really quickly that there are a lot of people who are housing rich and cash poor. I, I put a beautiful uh, woman who's uh, older than me up there. <laughs> I don't know the correct term. We used to call them senior citizens. I don't know if that is. But imagine someone who uh, has lived in this house for many years, has lots and lots of memories, maybe finds themselves living alone where they had a spouse for many, many years, um, and now they have four or five spare bedrooms, and they don't want to move, but they don't have the money to fix the roof. They don't have the money to uh, upgrade the, the furnace in the basement. Um, they struggle to mow the yard, and they can't pay someone to shovel the sidewalks. And so the option is they can, they can go to the financial system and get a reverse mortgage. They'll sell you those products. No, thank you. Um, they can sell and move to, you know, the five over one for old people out on the edge of town. 
away from their church, away from their friends, away from their connections, away from the life and the memories and all that. That's what we say their options are today. The option that they would have had 100 years ago is to say, you know what? I'm going to take that one of those spare bedrooms. I'm going to put an exterior door on it. I'm going to throw in a kitchenette. And uh, I'm going to rent it out as an apartment. We can literally do that in a weekend. But it is illegal in most cities in North America. Backyard cottages, I know that there are some uh, things that have been done in this city to loosen up backyard cottage rules. Um, please don't call them ADUs. That sounds like a disease. <laughs> we have to, uh, to our fellow community members, we have to communicate clearly and with empathy. Um, call them what they are, their backyard cottages. Like, I can get my mind wrapped around that. If I go to you and say, you know, support accessory dwelling units, you're like, I don't, I don't want to catch that disease. <laughs> Um, backyard cottages, oftentimes when we brand them well, we talk about them as granny flats or a place that like a family member can move into. I think the most common use of them are college students, um, people who are going through a divorce or a life transition, or young families who are getting started. Those are the kind of the, the, the more general use case. We can build these things. We have, I mean, I, I toured all over your city here today. Uh, we have lots and lots of extra space to do this. And if you think about people who have paid too much to get into a house and now are having trouble realizing their other dreams because they have this mortgage that they have to pay and they have this house that they have to maintain that was too much for them, a way to augment your income, a way to make this work is to build something like this and become an owner and a landlord on the same property. We can do these at scale. And again, these are the types of units that we most desperately need. Um, again, don't call them tiny houses. Tiny houses sounds like some kind of fetish that we you know, have, a place to house poor people, something we can go gawk at. Look at the cute little tiny house. Um, these are starter houses. If we build them right, they're starter houses. In fact, we can go to some of your old historic neighborhoods in this community, and we can see lots and lots and lots of starter houses. Now, many of them won't look like starter houses. They'll look like larger homes. Why do they no longer look like starter houses? Because what do you do with a starter house? Something like 400, 500, 600 square feet. You get into it, you start building equity, you save a little bit of money, because you got into this thing cheap because it's a smaller house, okay, we're going to put an addition on the back. Oh, we had a kid. We're going to put a second story on. The neighbor's going to come over and help. We'll go help the neighbor. This is the way we built communities. We co-created places for thousands and thousands of years. We didn't get into a bigger house than we could afford and then try to grow our income into it. We started with what we could afford and added on to it as we went. We allowed families to have stability while they were able to co-create, grow our neighborhoods. The idea of a starter house is something that, again, we, we make illegal in most cities. There's certainly no financial product for this. If you go to Wells Fargo and say, I'm building a 400 square foot home, they'll say, good luck with that. There's no, there's no bundling of that on a secondary market. That's not a standardized product. And so even though there's massive demand for this kind of thing, they're not being built, they're only being built in places where they can be, like I said, fetishized. In the book, we talk about three things that we can do here at the local level to bring about this effect. And, and let me be very clear. We are going to have single-family homes financed on the secondary market with 30-year mortgages. We are going to have five over ones and apartments being built, and they will be financed on a secondary market with long-term securities. We are going to have those things. We're not going to do away with those. But what we can do locally is we can anchor our market around a product that is not available today. And by building lots and lots of that product, we can give people a place to opt out of this system. They can build into that system. 
They can grow into that system, but they will have a lower rung on the ladder in which to get started. And not only is this going to be helpful for families um, and, and, and people who are starting out, um, but it's going to house people who are struggling to find housing today. There's three things we need to do to make this come about. The first thing we need to do is reform our regulatory approach to building this type of housing. We make it really easy to build. Second, uh, we need to create an ecosystem of people who are building this type of thing. It's a very different style of builder, and we can do things to help them. Uh, third, we need to actually localize the finance of building these units. We need to create the marketplace that does not exist today. Let me walk through how we're going to do these things. At Strong Towns, we have a saying, no neighborhood uh, can be exempt from change. But no neighborhood should experience radical change. The agreement that we have made culturally in this great suburban experiment, this post-war uh, pattern of development, is that when we build your neighborhood, we will build it complete to a finished state. And there it will ever, forevermore be as it is. But if your neighborhood really, really falls apart, because let's face it, some of you are horrible, awful people, and you know, your neighborhoods are just trash. Um, in those neighborhoods where you're disenfranchised and you won't show up to meetings and all that, um, we're going to take those and dramatically transform them. That, that was all sarcastic, by the way. I don't believe that. But that's the deal we've made with ourselves, right? And this sets up a scenario where you are either going to be on the menu or not for the redevelopment. What we have talked about forever at Strong Towns is that neighborhoods are complex places. They're, they need to be able to adapt, to grow, to thicken up, and mature. I have found that the way to think about this best is to think about an infant being born. Um, when a child is born, they are not born, thank God, as a teenager, right? They're born as something that we can fall in love with. <laughs> um, they're born as a beautiful baby, right? And as they grow, they go through this metamorphosis where they become a toddler, then they become an adolescent, then they become a preteen, and then a teenager, I'm sorry, and then a young adult, right? And they go through this process, and we see them grow. They're the same person, but they are a more mature version of themselves. This is the way, historically, we have built neighborhoods. They start small, they grow up over time, Things are enhanced, expanded, replaced, rebuilt, and they grow up. What we have said as a post-war uh, culture is that we are going to build things in their final state, and that is it. That does not work, and it does not work for a variety of reasons. And, and I'm going to tell you, go look at the neighborhoods you built in the 1950s and 60s and just see like why, right? The, the best neighborhoods in town are the ones that were built in the last 20 years, right? And then the next best neighborhoods are the ones that were built 20 years before that. And then the next best neighborhoods were the ones that were built 20 years before that. Somehow we think that the ones we built in the last 20 years are going to be great forever. It's a cycle. When you build things and design them not to change, they can't adapt to stress, they can't adapt to opportunity, they can't overcome adversity. And so you wind up in a scenario where stagnation is the best option because the only other option on the menu is falling apart. When a neighborhood falls apart, what we do is we go and prey on it. Um, we see people of lesser financial means, people who tend to be more disenfranchised and disconnected, uh, occupying these neighborhoods, and they become easier places to prey on. And so we wind up with the grand bargain, as some housing advocates have called it. The grand bargain is this. Uh, all of you can be NIMBYs and keep your neighborhoods exactly as they are if you shut up and stay home and don't argue about us transforming your neighborhood. What happens when we transform neighborhoods like this is we really radically distort the underlying land values. We take neighborhoods and we actually force them into decline when we do it like this. At Strong Towns, Every neighborhood needs to be able to evolve and adapt to the next level of development intensity. And let me say this very clear so that all the people are like, what, what, 
What does this mean for me? If you live in a neighborhood of single family homes, there should be no regulatory friction for your neighborhood evolving into a neighborhood of duplexes. That's what it means to allow the next level of development intensity. And when I say evolve, I mean actually like easy. I don't care if you want to have two years of plan reviews and historic reviews and da 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 for the big five over one that wants to go in out in the middle of nowhere, disconnected from transit and biking lanes and all that. And I saw some of those today too. Here we built, you know, 800 units out in the middle of nowhere. You can't bike to it, you can't walk to it, you can't get on a bus. But hey, it's high density. You have to be able to convert your bedroom, your spare bedroom into an apartment. You have to be able to build a backyard cottage. You have to be able to build a starter home. You've got to be able to do these simple things, convert your single family home into a duplex. You've got to be able to do this, and the regulatory burden needs to be easy enough to where you can walk in at 9 in the morning with a completed permit application, and you can walk out by noon with a permit. If we can't make it that simple, we're doing it wrong. And I know for some regulatory people, that like freaks them out. Again, we're not talking about radical leaps and changes. Go ahead and regulate the heck out of that. But the simple stuff we have to make really easy to do. And guess what? If the old lady up the street rents out her bedroom, nobody's going to know anyway. <laughs> Why do you have to have a public hearing? Why do you have to drag that person through meetings? Why do you have to make them genuflect in front of the planning commission? Why do you have to do this? You don't. This is a very, very simple thing to do. I know you've done some of this here. For those of you that are not from here, and I'm not aware of what you have done in your communities, it, it, there's a lot of different reforms that we have in the book, but like the headline one, uh, make it easy to incrementally grow, and then you have to get rid of your parking codes. Like it, parking is the dumbest land use. It really is. Recognize that everywhere you see a parking lot, you are seeing a massive public expense in draining storm water, providing uh, access by a street, providing sewer and water service that are not used in any way with no corresponding tax base or value provided. The, these are the greatest underutilized uh, assets that we have, and we need to fill every single one of them with, with stuff, including housing. We need an army of incremental developers. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why these very logical, small units are not being built. Um, two of the most prominent ones is that there's no, way to find, there's no easy way to finance them. There's no real market for financing them at scale. And second, because of that, there's no one really to build them. There's lots of people who would do this work, who would be glad to do this work. There are whole cadres of incremental developers across the country who are being trained, who are doing this kind of work, um, but you're not going to see D.R. Horton, you're not going to be Sentex Homes, you're not going to see one of the you know, 25 uh, major builders who are building all the apartments in the country. You're not going to see any of them doing this kind of work. It doesn't scale, it doesn't work for them. And, and really, quite frankly, at the end of the day, it requires someone who has a degree of love for the neighborhood. Because the payment that you will get is both a financial payment and the joy and satisfaction of being able to walk by, be in a neighborhood that you have helped to build. When we talk to incremental developers, they will talk about the payoff in that way. And let me just say something. I don't think I'm going out on a limb. We will all do crazy things for love, right? It's the first word up there. We'll all do crazy things for love. You get people who love a neighborhood, they will do crazy things. Like spend their evenings and weekends building housing, right? Um, when we think about incremental developers, you're not thinking about someone with a hard hat uh, and a cadre of engineers and, and planners and what have you and architects. What you're talking about is someone who cares about a place. They often irrationally care about it. We talk a lot of incremental developers off the ledge, like you love this house too much. It's not a good project. Um, but the reality is, is that incremental developers look like you. 
They are the type of person who uh, are underemployed and would like to do something different. They're the kind of person who's willing to take their evenings and weekends to work on a side project. It's maybe a teacher who has uh, summers that are more open where they can work on something like this. In fact, I've never done this before. I've, I, literally, I've never done this before, but let's do this. How many of you in this room either do incremental development projects, like these kind of one-off, one-house type of work, or would be interested in doing it if there was a way to clear the financial hurdle? Raise hands. <laughs> That's astounding. I've never done that before. That, ah, man. I'm a little overcome. Um, there are groups that are training people to do this. There's the Incremental Development Alliance, which is a partner organization of ours. It's doing great work. We've got some of this stuff on our website uh, to help people get started. The thing that we can do locally, and we talk about this at length in the book about some of the things that South Bend, Indiana has done, and some other cities have done to encourage this. The thing about incremental developers is that they are in competition with each other, but it is such a friendly competition. Um, they are really in competition with the broader market. And what you see is that when you build an ecosystem of them, when you can get them together, get them talking, get them working together, they'll do things like, hey, you're having, I'm having trouble financing this. Oh, dude, I know a guy at a bank. Let me get you hooked up. Oh, I had this carpet layer who was horrible. Oh, yeah, don't use that person. Here, I got someone over here. They help each other. They build up this community, and they work and transform neighborhoods in the most beautiful way. The third thing we need to do then is localized finance. And this is the one that is scary to people. And it's scary to people because we don't, we all feel like we, we kind of understand finance, but we don't understand finance. And we look at this and we're like, oh, this is really freaky. Um, what we need to do today, and I am talking about local government primarily, what we need to do today is kind of the opposite of what the federal government did in the 1930s. The federal government in the 1930s came in and said, we see broken local markets. We are going to nationalize this market to make this work. What we need to do is say, we see broken national markets. We need to create a local market to make this work. We have the capacity in City Hall to actually do this transformation, to finance this, to support this, to make this come about. I'm going to give you a few examples of places that have done this. Um, this is something that we talk about in the book and we give examples in the book. Uh, since the book has come out, there has been a lot of demand for more information on this. And we are working kind of internally to put together a, a broader report, kind of giving some more step-by-steps. But let me give you the, the broad overview here. This is a group in Oswego, New York. This is the only one of these I'm going to show you that is wholly private. Um, this neighborhood group saw uh, that they had a bunch of neighborhoods in their community that were struggling. Um, and a big part of the struggle was that people living in the neighborhood uh, had means, but they didn't believe that their neighborhood was going in the right direction. And so they were holding back on showing their neighborhood uh, the love that it needed. And so what they did is they said, we can get this unstuck. And they created this micro-grant program. They will give you a 50% match if you do something to make the outside of your property better. You have to be able to see it from the street. So I've got to be able to walk by and see that this property is better. Here's the catch. You can't apply as an individual. You can only apply as a block. Because what they want is they want the aha effect of a whole block transforming all at once. And so you have to have, it was like 70% of the block apply. And it's, the stories are beautiful. They'll have people who like, I was going to repaint my house, go next door and talk to their neighbor. And the neighbor's like, yeah, I wanted to replace the windows, but gosh, this neighborhood's not going in the right direction. I wasn't sure. Well, here, there's a grant we can get to do that. Okay, we got to talk to the guy across the street. Uh, I'm not interested in doing anything. Well, we, will you plant some flowers in the yard? All right, if it helps you guys out. And all of a sudden, what they call the bank run on confidence was reversed with tiny amounts of money. And people who lived in the neighborhood would go, and all of a sudden, this block would be entirely transformed. It's, it's, ni it's a nicer place. And there'd be a little sign about the grant, right? And then another block is transformed. And pretty soon, people started to believe in the neighborhood again. 
And they weren't waiting for the grant. They were taking their own money off the sidelines and saying, I'm in, let's do it. Muskegon, Michigan is using a tool that is probably the most widely abused tool uh, in local economic development, tax increment financing. I called this the devil's tool of decline once uh, in a thing that got a lot of people really angry at me, but I keep saying it, so I obviously think I'm right. Um, <laughs> that, was a, that was not Minnesota nice. Um, <laughs> Muskegon has taken this tool and uh, used it for good. Um, what they have done is they've said, when we have lots that are infill lots, so vacant, empty lots that are in our core neighborhoods that have been vacant for decades, so like the market is not building something here, um, we will finance, using tax increment financing, part of the construction of a starter house in these neighborhoods. They're not going to build, a, you can't go build a 3,000 square foot mansion. You've got to build a starter home. I think they've said between uh, 400 and 1,100 square feet or something like that. It's got to be a modest place. And really, this is very simple how this works. Um, when you have a vacant lot, you're paying this much in tax. When you go and build a house on it, you pay this much in tax. That difference, they're taking and applying that to a second loan that the government takes out on your behalf. So what the city does is the city goes and borrows the money. Let's say the house costs 200,000 and your tax increment financing will pay 40,000 of that. The city will pay 40,000 and you will pay 160 for that house. So it would be 200, now you pay 160. And then for the next decade or 12 years or 15 years, your taxes will go to paying off that loan. They have built dozens of homes in their core neighborhood this way. And the beautiful thing about it is as they're filling in their neighborhoods, their neighborhoods are getting better. So these houses are not just places to house people, but it actually accelerates upward the kind of love and energy that you're getting in these core neighborhoods. We can use this to finance uh, backyard cottages. We can use this to finance all kinds of things. That all, the only catch is, whatever you do has to make the property increase in value. And we can capture that and use it to build housing. Um, in California, uh, they have had a, a very serious initiatives to build a lot of these backyard cottages. And this, they're still using the word ADU. I wish, the, they're California, they're weird. Um, you know, better branding, I think, would go a long ways here. But... Um, California, the fascinating thing that I have found is there, there is such now an aggressive market for this that you can buy a, a, a backyard cottage with the same type of financial friction as you can buy a used car. It's like an impulse buy. Have you ever gone to a used car lot and you're like looking at the car and then the guy comes out and he says, you know, would you like it? And you're like, eh, maybe. And then he hands you a piece of paper and if you just sign here, you can drive off the lot, right? It's like instant financing. You can walk into uh, one of these lots that are selling these backyard cottages, and you can say, yeah, I like this one. And they say, you want to drive it off the lot? Sign here, and we'll have it installed in your house in 60 days, and you can be generating rental income in day 61. We'll take care of all the permitting, all the utilities, all the stuff. We'll pour the slab. We'll drop it in. Just pick the unit you want, and we'll put it down. Just sign here. This is what creating a market for this stuff can allow to happen. Um, in Minnesota, which by the way is a pretty cool state, I don't want to brag, um, in Minnesota, we can use special assessments for housing. So if you want to convert that spare bedroom into an accessory apartment, um, the city can actually finance that for you. Uh, if you want to build that backyard cottage, the city can actually finance that for you directly. The same way we finance a sewer project or a water project or a road construction project. The city goes out and builds a road. Uh, the city pays contractors to do that. Uh, then you get an assessment, and that goes on your taxes, and you pay it twice a year until it's paid off. We can use special assessments for housing. Here's the cool thing about this. And if you've noticed so far, everything that I've shared with you and everything I will share with you, the cost to the local government is nothing. We're not asking local government to spend stupid money subsidizing housing. We're asking local government to create a market that doesn't exist today, not to do it at a loss. If you do a special assessment, okay, 
The way you would normally build, say, a backyard cottage is to go to a bank and get a home equity loan. And the home equity loan has this like long process. A lot of uh, people don't like to do them. Maybe they don't have equity in their home. Maybe they have limited equity. Maybe getting a home equity loan would require them to have mortgage insurance and add extra costs. Uh, maybe they just like the idea of owning their house and don't want to do, you know, in a sense, like a short-term uh, reverse mortgage. Maybe they don't like this. I don't blame you. There's a lot of friction involved in this. Um, if you get a second mortgage and you default on your house, the idea of a second mortgage is that your first mortgage gets paid off first, and then the second mortgage holder gets whatever's left off, left over. So they will charge you a higher interest rate. They're going to finance that over a short period of time. They're going to require you to make more payments. It's going to be more burdensome. Here's the thing about a special assessment. A special assessment jumps in front of the primary mortgage. Banks hate this. Because if you somehow default on your house, guess who gets paid back first? The city. Before anybody else, before Wells Fargo gets their money, before any securitization gets their money, the city gets made whole. I am not telling you that your city should be making dumb investments. I'm telling your city you can make good strategic investments. Special assessments are one of them. In Florida, we have seen local governments and philanthropic organizations be willing to co-sign on these starter units. You're going to go to a local bank and they're going to say, we don't have a product for this. You can do a home equity loan, but that's the only product we have. We don't have a product for a backyard cottage. We don't have a product for you converting your spare bedroom into an apartment. We don't have that product. We just don't have it. Okay, I get it. This is too much risk for a local bank to take. If the city steps in and says, hey, do that product. Do it over 10 years. We know it gives you some risk. We will co-sign it. We'll be like your grandpa, right? My grandpa, I bought a drum set when I was 15. And uh, my, uh, my grandpa co-signed on the loan because no bank was going to give a 15-year-old drummer a loan. <laughs> um, basically, the city can be your grandpa. Go to the bank. We'll co-sign the loan with you. How much does this cost the city to do? Nothing, right? We need the housing. We need it built. We can subsidize it all over and lose tons of money, or we can help people do what they want to do. And by the way, if there's a massive market in our city, these things will cash flow. There's very, very low risk. Philanthropy can provide the same thing. And in Florida, we've seen them do this. Here's the takeaway. Local governments, and to a lesser extent, philanthropic organizations, can help finance at scale huge amounts of low-cost, high-quality housing. And they can do it at no cost to taxpayers. We are just filling a market need that does not exist today. We are just filling something that the current market ignores. I'm not asking cities to do dumb things. In fact, Strong Towns is all predicated on cities have to do the math, have to take care of their finances, have to be great solvent places. But we do need to step in and help create this market. This feeling of hopelessness that pervades this conversation is really a feeling that is, is, is part the problem is so huge we don't know how to really affect it, part the problem is distant and financialized and, and weird and we're like not the right people to do it, and it is part not knowing where to get started. We can get started right now fixing our regulatory process, encouraging and nurturing an ecosystem of local developers to do this work, getting them connected, helping them. And we can finance this revolution locally without costing us a dime. If we do these things, not only can we escape the housing trap, we can get rid of this feeling of hopelessness, and we can help our neighbors live better, more prosperous lives. I'm sitting here, and again, I'm looking at love, faith, and hope. And, and, and as I think about the things that we can do, we can show our neighbors a lot of love. Uh, we can have faith that uh, as our neighborhoods grow and change and evolve, they will become better places. 
in our image as we co-create. And at the end of the day, we can give people a lot of hope that I can live here. I can see myself having a place here. I don't, I'm not going to be priced out. I can see myself, even if I leave and go to college, coming back and being part of this community, I can see a future for me here. And at the end of the day, um, I think that's what we all just want, right? Is a little bit of hope. Thank you for indulging me tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming out. And thank you for all the, the generosity and love that you've shown me. Really appreciate it. We're a little bit over time. Yeah, it's not it's when you're so like attentive and like you smile, I like go on and on. I can do this in like 10 minutes, but when they... <laughs> this was more fun, I guess. <laughs> um, so we're a little bit over time. If anyone has, we'll, t we'll take two questions uh, from people who think they have something that is good for the whole audience. For anyone else who has a question, Chuck will be here uh, for an, to hang out afterwards. I, I would love to, uh, if you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, I, I, would, I would love to do that, so please. And I know some of you have a couple books, too. I, don't, I used to be really, like, weirded out about book signing because I'm like, why am I this weird? I get it now, and I'm happy to sign books, too. So, I'm an incremental developer. Oh, you're an banks, incremental developer. Banks don't loan on land. Bless you. Without yes. the land, you can't build the house yes. or the community. Yes. So can you help me with that financing? Um, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, I'm going to say, in theory, yes. I mean, I look at like what they're doing in Muskegon with t tax and rent financing, and absolutely, like the land purchase is part of it. I, I think that you know, part of part of the the. I, I think there's two sides of the problem here. Um, one is that you have created a system, and I say you, not you personally, but like we as a community, have created a system that highly rewards land speculation. Um, that is a problem that throwing money at it won't help. I do think that there are things we can do from a tax standpoint. The land value tax is something that's bandied about a lot. I talk about that in the book. I think there are things we can do to uh, diminish the idea that outside speculators can kind of exploit scarcity in our community to, to, to make money that way. Um, but I do think that the lowest friction thing we can do is to find partners. And those partners, from an incremental developer standpoint, will often look like people who own homes already, who are helping do things in their home. So I own a house. I would like a backyard cottage. I need an incremental developer to help me with that. You don't have to buy the land and go through that whole process. That's the like, least friction approach. Please. Uh, what's your opinion of community land trusts? That's okay. I'm hard of hearing, too. <laughs> uh, what is your opinion of community land trusts? I got this question yesterday from some college professors at uh, Purdue University in Fort Wayne, and they did not like my answer. Um, <laughs> and I've been thinking about it ever since. Like, how would I word this in a way uh, that didn't make people mad? Um, yeah, well, I, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to make you um, I understand, I think, where things like land trusts and cooperatives, I, 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 I get where they are coming from. In a massively distorted market like we have, like, like we were just discussing, um, there is an uh, umbrella effect or a shelter from the storm that a land trust can give you, right? Um, a cooperative model, things like that. Um, because we can take, in a sense, um, the financialized predatory aspect of the pricing and, and dull that, take that out of the equation. So I get the impetus behind thinking that these are really good models. Um, I have never been in a situation where I either fought against one or recommended people fight against them. I feel like they are a response in the system. They're not my response. And here's the downside of them that I fear. And let me just acknowledge, I have the luxury of fearing, right? I'm, I have a house. Uh, I would like my kids to be able to move back to the, the community, but um, I, I'm, I'm speaking from a place where I'm not struggling the way a lot of people 
who uh, embrace these are, are closer to people who are struggling. My concern with them is that they lack long-term dynamism. They, in a sense, take the worst underlying aspect of our system, which is stagnation, and they embed it in like the actual deed, the actual like underlying mechanism of the property. So if I get down the road 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, and I find that this arrangement, the, the, the struggle we have then would say, you know, we built 10 units in this uh, land trust. Um, we really need to make it 20 units or 30 units or 40 units. It's in a neighborhood now that has some dynamism. We've done things great. It's moving along. Um, that becomes the place that is stuck. That is a long-term concern. And so like I said, I'm not, like I don't spend my nights like worrying about it. But if we tried to solve this by having like land trusts all over the place, I think we would reinforce the stagnation that is actually underlying our problem, our core problem. And so applause to people who are, I always say, if you're bringing, if you're bringing something to the table to deal with this problem, I'm going to applaud you. Like, let's do it, right? I'm not going to fight you. Um, but if we as a community are trying to solve this problem, I think there are things that work better than, than others. And I would put land trust in the other category simply because of its lack of dynamism over time. Yeah, totally. You don't look angry. Thank you. Thank you for that generosity. I'm... Yeah, these professors were not happy with me. I think, that, I think one of them probably had a thesis or something about how great these were, <laughs> and we're hoping I would affirm uh, their thesis. So, um, Thank you, everybody, so much. I will uh, yeah. gladly sit and chat with people, if, whoever wants to talk. We hope to see you all in the lobby. There's a few organizations out in the lobby that are working to make housing more affordable in our community. Thank you again to Chuck, and thank you all for being here.